thank you for bearing with the long day and coming to the final session of the day. I will, I promise, not go over. If anything, I'll try and keep this briefer and allow for a longer Q&A, because I know everyone has drink tickets, and whatever type of beverage you're going to have, I don't want to keep you from it. So let me start off by saying, as always, please silence your cell phones. I was just doing that now. Um, and for PASS itself, I'm sure you guys are aware, having been here for a couple of days now, that there is a huge variety of different options here. I do want to call out that this is an amazing conference and there are a ton of different options, and please take advantage of them. They range from the drinks and the reception in the exhibit hall coming up to all of these different presentations, conferences, other engagement ways um, to really just get connected with people. And the goal of this is to really bring people together. So thank you all for coming here. For myself, uh, I'm a data scientist who works with companies around the world. So right now, I'm headquartered uh, over in Santa Monica, actually, because I got very tired of winter. And coming up to Seattle reminds me of Boston, where I was born and raised. And that's really in a bad way. I can't imagine how it's going to be in another month or two. But I moved over to Santa Monica to try and have at least somewhat nice weather. Now, for me, I come from a company called Data Robot that works with different companies around the globe on trying to figure out how to help them deliver AI. Today, I really want to talk about how it's not just the for-profit world, but how nonprofits can actually take advantage of AI and machine learning, what those terms actually mean, what some of the challenges we've seen in getting those implemented and really delivering an impact with those projects. What does that look like? And how does that work in practice? Now, data for good, there are a lot of different things that people think of when you say that. Fundamentally, though, I would say that anything that's trying to impact in a positive way, not just a company's bottom line, their profits, their costs, something else like that, but helping people around the world, often via nonprofits, via governments, things along those lines, having a positive impact on them, that's really what Data for Good stands for. What I'm going to talk about is general progression of machine learning and AI projects, what we've seen work commercially, how that extends out to nonprofits, a couple of case studies that we've seen in practice, and talking about how, from our perspective, we think this can extend out further and further in a sustainable fashion. So the agenda here, because no slide deck is complete without an agenda, is talking about a little bit of the disconnect that you can sometimes see with AI for good. The second is talking about our company's specific approach, and then making this more interesting by talking about a specific case study, as well as what's ahead. So, a lot of different quotes, a lot of different perspectives here. But for those who have thought about AI and machine learning or tried to get a sense of what those mean, they're buzzwords at this point. And it's almost impossible to distinguish between what they mean from person A to person B to person C. Everybody, though, says things like this, that it's the fourth industrial revolution, that it's making an enormous impact, that the people who are going to be affected by this are not just the engineers building self-driving cars or the people doing translations over at Google or Microsoft or Amazon, but everybody around the world. And my perspective on this is that AI and machine learning have gotten intertangled. The simplest thing that I think about for those is that machine learning is very narrow. Think of it as predicting a number, an outcome, an event, a number. You're predicting something tangible. AI is more of the system that would bring together, say, ad hoc business rules it might include predictions from machine learning. It might include neural networks or things that have just trained themselves on different amounts of data. But it's all encompassing. So an example is, historically, when you call in two telecoms, they do your best to dissuade you from staying on their phone trees and causing you to hang up as soon as they can. That's itself an AI program. They have different heuristics. You have to put in your number. You're sent to person one. They ask what your number is. They then say you're in the wrong department and send you to someone else and so on. And you can imagine. You could use machine learning to predict when I, call, uh, when I dial in, I'm actually calling because I'm angry. And then I should be sent to somebody who can help with that or escalate that in advance to try and save me as a customer. There are many different ways to really view AI and machine learning, though. As long as you're using them to make predictions, forward-looking, not just looking back at the past and what's happened, that's basically what people mean. And in this case, when you think about how AI will transform over the next several years, the next decade, Think of it as moving away from descriptive statistics, not just dashboards, not just what's happened or answering questions about what was going on, but what will happen or what should happen or what should you do. In practice, 
there are some examples in healthcare for uh, this specific instance, where if you think about sepsis, it's infections. These days, if you go to a hospital, you probably want to avoid staying there, if you can, for any amount of days, because there's an increased risk of actually getting infected or catching sepsis while you're there in a number of different circumstances. But what can actually help out here is that even though sepsis kills a few hundred thousand people a year, hospitals around the world, and especially across America, can start to predict where sepsis or where infections will occur, try to circumvent them in advance, because once they take hold, they're tenacious. It's hard to actually get rid of them with antibiotics or other medicines. So what you can do instead, if you're using AI and machine learning in a hospital setting, is predict who's going to catch sepsis, who's at least at the highest risk of catching that, and take preventative actions in advance. Maybe move them to a different wing of the hospital. Maybe actually send them out to another institution or another wing or something else like that. Healthcare can also use this, not just from a patient perspective, but to predict, for example, how many patients will come to the hospital on a given day. What you can do with that is both manage staffing for nurses. There is a global and certainly national shortage of nurses at this point. And knowing how many patients are going to show up in, say, pediatrics or the emergency room, getting a sense of that in advance helps with long-term scheduling. And if you expect there's going to be a spike, maybe tomorrow, because the Patriots have done amazingly well. I'm from Boston, so I'm still rooting for them. And you expect that people are going to show up not on Sunday, but the next day, you can also bring people in on a short-term basis. So across the board, for something like healthcare, if you think about it as predicting an event, will someone become sick or not? How many patients will show up? That's how AI has started to affect the industry. Alternatively, you can imagine this in terms of something a little bit closer to what we'll be talking about. So actually figuring out when to plant crops. If you talk to farmers, I guarantee they know this. They have decades or generations of experience, but the goal here is to figure out how they can better optimize this, and especially as there might be different weather events or additional information coming in, where it may be that rain is going to be moving in from different parts of the country or they're expecting different things in advance, and as there's more uncertainty around some of the variability in weather and climate conditions, it can help give them another piece of information. And it's not meant to override their experience or their judgment, but to help inform them in terms of when they should consider or what range they could consider planting their crops in. Again, predicting out in advance, when should they be doing things and augmenting their decision-making process. Finally, poverty is pervasive. It's been a little bit of a shock, honestly, to me, moving from Boston over to Los Angeles and seeing what the range of homeless look, look, uh, looks like in practice. In Boston, it's a little bit hidden behind the scenes. It's too cold out, so people are often, in some way, shape, or form, finding shelter. Whereas in Los Angeles or parts of the country where it's warmer, there's no way to avoid the impact that it has. In this case, there are some organizations, and USC, down in Southern California, for example, has been trying to figure out who the biggest influencers are. And it sounds awful because it reminds you of Instagram or social media, but they're trying to figure out which of the people within homeless populations or suffering from poverty are the best bellwethers or the best influencers to help adopt and take in new projects or new offerings that can improve the lives of everyone who's suffering from homelessness. In that case, it's also trying to figure out who would be most receptive to, say, HIV medication or HIV uh, prevention programs and trying to get them to adopt it in advance and then spread that out throughout the larger population. The point of doing this is not to say that this is the right way to do it or that AI and machine learning will magically solve this problem. It's meant to use information and data that's been gathered, try to find different patterns and ways to use that data to actually make good predictions and do that instead of just rolling out a program to everyone and leading to basically efforts spread too thin. If you think about building a stack of papers or applications to review, if you're just spending that time randomly going from top to bottom, you end up spending too little time on the people most receptive or the highest risk or the most likely to adopt something, and too little time, or too much time rather, on the people who aren't gonna be receptive at all. If machine learning can help triage that and say you should refocus your efforts on the top 10%, top 20%, some sort of stack ranking, you can get much better outcomes even if you don't change your actual process. Now, the challenge is for developing nations, for nonprofits, they don't have the organization or the resources that, for example, Amazon, Microsoft, or Google can bring to bear. Those companies alone hoover up almost all of the data science talent and engineering talent across the country, 
at least a big fraction of it. It feels like at times. And in terms of what these organizations can turn to and what they can do, it's not always obvious. And they face challenges that a lot of businesses have started to confront and really grapple with. But on top of the lack of resources and the challenges that any organization faces trying to implement AI in practice, they often fall short. Now, again, if you think about this in terms of the opportunity here, I do believe that AI and machine learning can offer a huge impact in pretty much any situation. But again, to actually realize this vision, you need the appropriate approach, the right policies, the right people to go forward and tackle this. What we've seen in practice from DataRobot is that the people who are doing the best and the companies doing the best are investing in pervasive AI. Think of this as not just doing this within a small line of business, doing it across R&D, doing it across finance, HR, sales, marketing. It's not just finding pockets of use cases or ways to deliver value or a single all-encompassing project. Those types of moonshots matter and they can deliver a ton of value, but for most companies it's incremental. You're not just going to say, we now have AI and it's solving everything. It's instead working to first um, maybe build propensity models. Who's going to respond to your marketing campaign? Who is most likely to actually purchase if you give them something? Or from HR, who's going to pay on time? How long until they pay? How many days until they actually give you X amount that may be above or below what you're expecting? These are the types of applications that start to build up little by little, but it requires domain knowledge to figure out what these are and identify them up front. The challenge is to actually then build out these solutions and to find ways to really get value from them, you need the people who can actually tackle this. And in practice, you often find that these are falling short. The big challenge here is really model development and model deployment. So if you think about this in terms of just taking that data and building a model to predict something, you need a data scientist or an engineer or someone who's comfortable with coding and stats and math. They then take that and they often throw it over the wall and say, at these organizations, IT, it's your turn to implement this. And they have a model in SAS or in R and Python. And the IT team then says, well, we're using C++. And they recode that and re-implement it and something gets lost in translation or it never makes it to production. And even more so, the teams who are actually responsible for monitoring, say, software, is it up and running, is it working, are then faced with the challenge that for machine learning, it's not just whether it's up and running, but whether it's delivering the right predictions. It's often actually worse to have a machine learning model that's giving you a prediction and having that prediction be wrong. And that can happen for a number of reasons. Maybe something is just broken with the code or the implementation, or maybe it's that something's changed. You can imagine all of the lenders in the world as you moved away from say 2006 and 2007, if they're using the same models in 2008 and 2009 that they were a couple of years ago, they're going to be in a world of hurt. And that applies even more quickly to situations where maybe you're shifting out factory lines in manufacturing, or when patient populations are actually shifting dramatically on a day-to-day -day basis, or if you're a retailer forecasting out what people want to buy as really fashion changes or the underlying inventory changes, or you start to approach, say, Black Friday. So the big issue here is both from the production side of things, how do you actually build these models and get them implemented, but it also has to do with transparency and with bias. There are a number, I mean, dozens of examples that have come up in the news. Some of them include um, issues actually getting value within MD Anderson in terms of cancer research. Others are things in terms of over at Amazon. They learned that some of the tools they were making, they were able to replace their recruiting process, but the recruiting process itself had been filtering for female applicants. So even though they were able to replicate their current process, it itself ended up being biased. And it can happen even more so if you just let these types of um, AI bots or chat bots out into the wild, where people then interact on Twitter and then they learn how to engage on Twitter, which is not necessarily what you want. All of these are not necessarily any problems with the companies themselves, their approach, or what they're doing. It's because it's hard to uh, really tackle these problems. It's hard to identify them in advance. And unless you have a good setup for how to evaluate, are these models or approaches ethical? Are they biased in some way? What sort of transparency do you have around them? You can end up with situations where the models themselves may actually be operationalized, may actually be working as you at least expected, 
but are then working in a way that is subtly, or in the case of the chatbot from Microsoft, very transparently not what you really wanted. So a quick note in terms of why this matters and why people are adopting this, even from our perspective at DataRobot, we've seen some of these companies deliver outsized value on single use cases or single applications. For example, that forecasting for the hospital. Steward Healthcare is, I think at this point, the biggest healthcare system in the US, and they were able to get, by predicting out their staffing, much more accurate predictions on who will come into their hospitals, and in turn, improve how they're actually figuring out short-term staffing needs and reducing down attrition from their nursing population. So getting a lot of value from a single application, that then if you think back to stacking those up across R&D, across marketing, across sales, adds up very quickly. And in some circumstances, especially if you're doing, say, SKU level forecasting for retailers, or some of the banking applications where you have enormous amounts of volume, they can have an even bigger outsized impact. The challenge here, how do you actually translate this over to, again, nonprofits? Or how do you translate this over to developing nations that don't have the same resources to go out and tackle these problems? It may not be the same ROI in terms of business impact or millions of dollars or things like that, and it may be harder to measure directly in the same sort of P&L terms, but it still matters, and it can still have an enormous impact. These are all, again, stats that people are roughly familiar with. There's 1.2 billion people living in poverty. There's one in three people who actually don't have access to clean drinking water. And there's about 800,000 children that are actually suffering from diarrhea every year and passing away. In this case, if you think about just water and hygiene and sanitation in general, if this is fixed or at least improved, it can have an enormous impact on the margins of millions and millions of people around the world. The question there is can AI actually help with improving that type of situation or helping maybe not solve that problem entirely, but again, finding ways to improve things on the margins and then incrementally get better outcomes. When you think about the options that nonprofits or NGOs um, and governments have, they don't necessarily solve the problem. The current efforts often boil down to one of these three options. So there are hackathons where people come together and give in a data set, try to figure out good solutions. There's free consulting. Think um, some of the strategy consultants like BCG or Bain or McKinsey or Deloitte or KPMG that are trying to help out and have pro bono type work here. There's volunteer data science, as people try and with their best efforts, whether through hackathons or other just more local outreach, find ways to help out. And there's also free software and cloud services. I guarantee that every company over here in Seattle is finding some way to offer, say, free credits on Azure or AWS. The challenge is these often don't really provide a sustainable solution because on top of the infrastructure and on top of the one-time events, the NGOs or the developing nations or whatever the organization may be, they often just don't have that many people or the resources to invest in AI over the long term. So if it's one, two, five, 10, 15 people, even if this can help jumpstart something or help deliver a one-off solution, it's not gonna help them maintain that over the coming months and years. That's often what ends up happening. Part of that, if you think about not just for nonprofits or developing nations, the challenges that companies in general face, these are companies that pour in millions and millions of dollars hiring very good data scientists. They have enormous IT teams that are investing in architecture and moving from Hadoop to cloud-based solutions to everything in between. And they're constantly trying to find ways to do this because they're incentivized to do so. If they don't do it, their company will either fall behind or actually fall out of certain markets. At a minimum, they'll leave profits on the table. And in these circumstances, when teams of dozens or hundreds of data scientists and associated personnel can't solve these problems and face some of the issues listed here, it makes you wonder how in the world NGOs or developing nations can possibly approach this. They're not gonna have anywhere close to the same number of resources. Realistically, you need to think about radically changing the approach to actually working through and tackling these problems and doing so in a sustainable way. And when I say sustainable, I really think about this as, suppose that somebody leaves, 
or some component here falls out? Can they continue to maintain the same programs or solutions they put in place? What type of upkeep will those require in terms of actually continuing to deliver on them? What does this mean in practice if they have to go and talk about what these solutions are to a government or to a non-technical agency or to people who are gonna be affected by this? Our approach, and there's no question that this is ambitious, is to set up a program that can actually help impact hundreds of thousands, ideally a million lives in the first year, and identify this by building out solutions that are powered by automated machine learning. This is not meant to be a silver bullet. It's not a solution that actually can help out and solve every problem in the world. But instead, the goal is to enable these nonprofits to actually develop and deploy and maintain these solutions, to really leverage data science talent and enable the teams themselves or the organizations or other people to get a good groundwork and a good basis for then being self-sustaining and self-sufficient. And at least at the start, providing some level of support to getting an initial solution in that can again then be maintained without continuing development efforts. And often most importantly, having conversations about the ethics or bias or what's going on with the models, because regardless again of how you structure or build these models, how accurate they are, how simple the deployments are, if the people who are gonna be affected by this or the people who are gonna be responsible for implementing these don't trust the solutions, don't have a sense of how they're working, they're never gonna be adopted or you're going to face an uphill battle from day zero to actually have an impact. So from my perspective, if you're coding up a solution for a machine learning problem, you have to do a number of different steps that range from data prep to deciding which algorithm to test, to tuning the hyperparameters, iterating through that, setting up a deployment, monitoring the solution, and making sure this plugs into some sort of application. It's an end-to-end -end process, and at any one of these points here, this is not meant to go into detail on this, you can fall off and just end up with a solution that doesn't go anywhere. Our goal is to enable, via automated machine learning, anyone who has a problem and the data set, which is not necessarily easy, to test out and deploy these models without needing a team of engineers or data scientists. In practice, it doesn't mean that data scientists go away. It instead lets nonprofits leverage their domain knowledge if they've got the data at least to start. And what that means in practice, we wanna help solve a lot of the problems that I mentioned earlier with great software, but it's really not sufficient. So from our perspective, we view this as needing additional help with an, a mix of things. Part of it's training. How do you get people involved up to speed on how machine learning works, how to think about these problems, and how to know when they're starting to fail? Part of it instead, think about this in terms of identifying the different opportunities, the different areas where machine learning can make a difference, and training the people involved on how they can then continue that on an ongoing basis. But from our side, we really view AI for Good as starting out by identifying some organizations that have data and have a problem that's suitable, at least from our perspective, for something that we can help with and help push them forward. And what we then do, we treat them as if they're a paying customer and look to make sure that they're going to be self-sufficient and that they can actually deliver something that will help and make an impact on their day-to-day -day problem. Now, the challenge here and this is fundamental not just to nonprofits or NGOs, is that you also need a sense of a framework for what AI ethics or what a governance policy actually looks like. Part of that's in terms of who's actually accountable for the design and what trade-offs you may face. If you think about some of the different algorithms or some of the different news articles around, say, um, for parolees, there are models and algorithms out there that are predicting who is not or who is going to suffer from recid uh, recidivism. So who's going to recommit a crime and end up back after parole in jail? The problem is those algorithms are fundamentally biased. There's no way around it. You can either tackle something that's going to really target the percentage of say, a population group or another population group and make sure that the algorithm is treating those percentages the same. You can treat absolute numbers of people the same, but you can't have both of those. So when you think about who's actually accountable for the design, you need people who are actually going to make sure that they take that into account and consider the impact of these models regardless of how the model itself is constructed. You also though need a sense of what this uh, disclosure looks like. When you take those decisions into account, what do they actually look like? And who's going to be affected 
and who should you actually tell in terms of what that will actually entail. And finally, there's that aspect of fairness in terms of what this actually means, what the impact will look like, and again, who's going to be affected by this in what way. Without these three components, and without the idea that someone does need to be accountable for those decisions, you can end up with a situation where people turn back and say, the algorithm did this, it's out of our hands. The reality is, if you take this into account up front, you can design or at least expect that this is going to happen and anticipate that in a reasonable way. So to give an example of what this looks like, the global water challenge is essentially tied back to that idea of sanitation and hygiene. It's based over in Washington, and they've been in business as an NGO for a number of years at this point. Their goal is to really help out with bringing clean water and clean sanitation to millions of people around the world, especially over in Africa. And the challenges there are that there are a huge number of people that don't have access to clean water. You would think this is a relatively simple problem to solve because you can drill wells, you can find ways to ship water out, or otherwise have something that will bring clean water or potable water to the people that need it. The challenge, though, is that you often end up in situations where the equipment itself is challenging to maintain, even if you have organizations that will, for example, dig a well or have a shipment on a one-time basis or recurring basis. It's hard to maintain that. And there are a number of reasons those can suffer from challenges. But in this case, there's a guy called Brian from the Global Water Challenge who's been spearheading efforts like this around the world. And he's seen time and time again that they can come in, help, for example, with drilling wells, finding a solution, and everyone celebrates. You cut the ribbon on that well, and then a year or two later, the well's no longer working and people go back to square zero. What he then did, he looked at where the data itself was in terms of how these wells were operating, what's happening with all of them, and it was a nightmare. It was a mix of cell phones, Excel sheets, paper documents, PDFs. Unsurprisingly, this is what organizations grapple with. The data is everywhere, physically, virtually, and otherwise. And what he then took on as his mission was saying, I know this data is valuable. I know we can use this to improve our outcomes across the country or across the countries in Africa. And what he then did, he actually pulled this data together, he collated it, and put this into a consistent format, even though different people and different organizations had different ways of characterizing a well or an issue or a failure or other things along those lines. And he ended up spending years actually pulling this together by hand on just a personal computer. By bringing this order to the data, at least the first pass of it, he was able to start to get a sense of what does this mean and what data is out there. And he put together an idea of a water data exchange. So think of this as he's done this. He now has a sense of what information is available, different formats, different countries, different languages, but what's possible. And by then putting together not just the global water challenge, but this specific aspect of how can people think about gathering this data, what data is important, he systematized this and it became much easier for organizations not just his own, but others or governments to start to track this. And I'd mentioned before, there's no question that to really tackle AI and machine learning, you need data. Without it, there's nothing to learn from, from the algorithmic perspective, and you can't really progress. So in this case, he had actually spent a number of years pulling this data together and then tried the traditional ways to leverage this. He was trying to figure out through hackathons, through free consulting that he was actually able to gather, and through free software resources, he tried all three. And the hackathon originally actually delivered some inter uh, interesting insights, but didn't really get to a final point where he could predict which wells are gonna fail when. The consulting helped, but it was an ad hoc perspective, and he never was able to get something that he could take and bring country to country or organization to organization. The problem that he then faced was when offered free credits, and he actually had a number of free credits and infrastructure that was available to him, as well as free training and data science boot camps, he just didn't have capacity. He was trying to run this organization and trying to find ways to connect out with different countries and organizations around the world. So he knew that he couldn't actually employ data scientists. He just didn't have the budget for it. 
Free resources weren't particularly working for him in this case. He needed to find something that would be a more sustainable solution. As he tried these different options, he started to realize as he went from month one to year one to year two to year three that maintaining all of this wasn't going to be feasible either. Finding a way to maintain this code base, to update it, to retrain it on new data, and to continue gathering that data to start with was just going to be out of the picture. So as he went through these different options, he started to actually question whether it was going to be worth the time that he'd spent gathering the data at all. And it wasn't really working in any way, shape, or form for him, at least at that point in time. One of my colleagues ended up meeting him, and I think it was at a conference like this, talking through some of the challenges he'd been facing. What they were able to do was to take that data and leverage automated machine learning to actually build these models and deploy them. And he was able to find a way that let him, even as not himself a data scientist, build these models, operationalize them, get the insights he needed from them, and take actions with them. So in this case, he found that this was actually a solution for his particular challenge. He had data. He couldn't actually do anything with the data. And when he had actually had models built for him, he couldn't maintain them or implement them in a reasonable way. What we as a company believe is that this is something that is itself sustainable, that by providing a platform for people to not necessarily need to be data scientists, to build these models and get them operationalized, you can end up in situations that let people actually identify, in this case, the red spots where wells are going to fail, to tie these into existing systems and not, again, need to invest significant data science resources. As a company, we believe that we can certainly help jumpstart these efforts, but a big piece of that is actually then training the organizations, the teams, the people involved to maintain this on their own. And by removing the need to maybe go to a data science boot camp to learn how to code in R or Python, or learn how to operationalize these models, you shift the focus away from more of the technical side and more of a focus on what types of problems are you trying to solve, how are you going to use this model if you do have it, and what does that then look like in practice? The challenge regardless, when you're talking to, for example, um, this is one of my colleagues who was over in Sierra Leone. He was speaking to a number of uh, government organizations and trying to train them on how machine learning works, and they were skeptical. They basically said, there's no way I could ever come up to speed on how these algorithms work, what's happening here. And he asked them to take a step back. He asked them to say, how long is it going to take you to get to work today? And people would raise their hand and say, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. And he'd say, OK, how did you know that? And they said, oh, well, you know, on a Monday, it takes this long. When it's raining out, it takes this long, and so on. Or I'll have to stop here, because I know there's traffic because of this event on this day. And his point was that that's the same way that these models work. And you don't necessarily need to explain every single aspect of a neural network or a tree-based model or a linear model, as long as you're able to frame the problem, again, in terms that say, what are you trying to predict? What would you do with that prediction? And then understand how those models actually start to get there. So rather than saying, how do the models work from a technical perspective, thinking about the variables that are important going into that, when you make individual predictions, what's driving those predictions, Think of it as adverse action, what's leading a prediction up or down. A lot of the techniques that data scientists have developed over the last even three or four years have been focused less around just increasing accuracy and more focused around transparency and explainability. In this case, the challenge that comes out of that is that if you find a solution for Sierra Leone, you then have to find solutions to extend this out and find something that scales. So part of that is for a single solution or a single model how do you actually build that and deploy it and maintain it? The other piece, though, is as you move away from that, how can you do that for the next country, the country after that, and so on? The advantage of automated machine learning is that you no longer need to rebuild every model, retrain it, and have a data scientist rebuilding every aspect. When you do have data scientists, this scales out their capabilities. It doesn't obviate the need to have data science talent and knowledge and expertise, but it shifts it again away from hands-on work building models, tuning hyperparameters, and coding up solutions every day, to instead saying, with domain knowledge, how do you frame these problems? How do you really approach them? And then how do you make sure that, with a solution in place, you can scale out the same thing again and again? So from our perspective, we work with different organizations and different partners. Um, we're trying to take some of the lessons that we've learned from the Global Water Challenge, 
and using that as a basis for expanding this out ourselves. So when we talk about sustainability, Global well, uh, Water Challenge, Sierra Leone, they're self-sufficient at this point and can maintain this and expand this out further, but we want to prove this out by working with additional organizations. So at this point, we've selected additional organizations to start to work with directly. It's not something that can scale out magically into millions and millions of organizations. It still requires work up front and getting people up to speed. So in this case, for example, Kiva is actually a crowdfunding platform. It's providing loans to different entrepreneurs. And although they funded well over a billion dollars in loans, they want to actually figure out how to reduce the number of unfunded loans. People ask for loans on the platform, and they don't find the right way to match up donors with those loans, and they don't, again, have the data science expertise to do this themselves. So what we want to be able to do here is figure out a way to not just build a single model or a single project, but enable them to build probably closer to three to 5,000 projects here to build micro-targeting across each of these different aspects and identify what's the right way to reach out to the right donor at the right time and do this, again, at a scalable basis. Alternatively, we work with different um, for-profit academic institutions. Donors Choose is actually a platform that, if you've used it before, think of a kindergarten teacher or a middle school teacher asking for, say, coloring books, other resources that they don't actually have budget for. The goal, again, is to find the right people and the right donors here. And not just that, but actually increase teacher retention and do this in a sustainable manner. So in this case, it's really that teachers move in and out of this program. You can imagine that teachers move on or move to different programs or different institutions. And by actually matching these up, we can help them avoid higher attrition rates by making sure they don't need to go to another school to get the resources that they're looking for. It's not a perfect solution, but given the state of a lot of the public school systems in the US, it actually has an outsized impact on helping teacher retention and student outcomes. UCSF is dramatically different in terms of what they're trying to do. They have a relatively small number of patients every year. There are some hospitals that have hundreds of thousands or millions of patients come through. But what they're doing is actually focusing purely on spinal cord injuries, and they're trying to figure out, again, patient outcomes. So not just from, say, the medical records or other details like that, but across the board, all of the information available, get better guidelines for traumatic spinal injuries, predict out which outcomes are going to be successful or not, and improve these outcomes patient by patient, again, in a scalable way. The doctors and nurses involved do not have time to go to a boot camp or learn how to code. And the institution itself just doesn't have that much uh, budget for actually hiring data scientists. Our goal here, think about this in terms of when you're actually connecting with different nonprofits, when you're talking through humanitarian projects, think of this in a couple of ways. One of them is finding a pervasive way to leverage AI and machine learning. There needs to be data to start with, and many organizations, frankly, are not going to have it. If you think about what you're trying to do long term, what type of thing are you trying to predict, what outcome are you looking for, what action can you take, what type of data could you use or could you leverage to make that type of prediction? If people start to gather it, our goal, and I think automated machine learning in general, is to make it much easier to build a model on top of that, given data along those lines. But if someone's not gathering data today, if they're not tracking the actions they're taking, if they're not looking at different aspects, it's going to be an uphill battle at best to actually have an outcome like that. The second thing, though, when you think about these models and what's actually happening, you really do need an idea of how the models are working and what the impact or adoption is going to look like. And even in different lines of business where you've got a marketing model or a model to predict fraud or to predict who's going to, for example, come to a given institution, you end up not necessarily thinking through how that's going to be adopted. If you talk to, for example, um, HR teams, if you can predict regrettable attrition with almost perfect accuracy, the idea of using a model like that in a business is going to give everyone second thoughts. You tell managers that they can figure out who on their team is going to leave, and they may thank you, but they're not going to use that in any way, shape, or form. They're going to know their team, they're going to know what's going on, and they're not going to bring up the fact that they suspect someone's leaving because that's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in practice, not just from really a business perspective, but more so from an organizational perspective, this matters even more. 
if you think about the impact that these models can have or what the uptake on them will actually imply, you need to put that in front as early as possible to get a good idea for what this would mean. Now, if there is an organization or if you have a team or a nonprofit or something else that may be a good fit for actually leveraging machine learning and doesn't have the resources today, please send in applications. We just finished up another round where we went through and selected more uh, organizations here. But our goal is to figure out good ways to scale this out further and further. We want to make sure that no matter which organization is out there, that they can take advantage of machine learning without hiring data scientists directly. If there are data scientists, they can further scale out what they're doing and do this effectively. But we've seen this work in practice at for-profit businesses and organizations around the world. We want to help bring this to nonprofits, NGOs, and developing nations in a way that is not going to be sustainable. There aren't enough data scientists for for-profit businesses. It's going to be almost impossible to find enough for all of the different organizations out there. So that's the high-level view of what I wanted to go through for the data for good and the overall process that we've seen. I wanted to pause here for general questions on this. What I wanted to do after that, and I had said up front that I recognize the time that we're facing and that this is the end of the day. Right now, I think it's about 5.30. My goal was to take about 45 minutes here for the presentation. I want to then answer questions, and then I'll go deeper into some of these aspects and go back into it for those who want to learn more. But I wanted to respect everyone's time on a busy day and a busy schedule and stop here for questions before going deeper into some of these aspects. So any questions so far? I work at an international NGO. Mm -hmm. I can totally back up what you're saying about skills call in terms of donating. We've gotten licenses. We've gotten things in uh, public hands. What I'm wondering is when you do a project like the Global Water, mm -hmm. It's a good question. So the question was, with something like the Global Water Challenge, how do you do, or how do you find a solution that can work for them, but then expand out and scale out to other organizations? And the answer is it's tough, frankly. So what we're experimenting with, not just within the NGO world, is how can we find scalable solutions for any organization to do this? And there is no silver bullet. We've seen different teams, different organizations, some with millions of people, or rather thousands of people, fail with delivering AI, we've seen small teams actually succeed. And the main pieces that we've seen up front is that it's a mix of software. You need a way to do this without necessarily having data scientists. But more importantly, it's identifying these problems and how they're going to work, and that requires a different mindset. So I think, frankly, what we've discovered is that it requires three things, as I mentioned. One is software to help with this, or some solution along these lines. The second is training. And both of these are really scalable. So how do you identify problems? How do you come up with a roadmap and think through what the adoption is going to look like? But the tough thing here is the data itself. And that's what I think is currently unsolvable in any way, shape, or form. If you don't have the data to tackle these problems, it's going to be impossible for everyone or anyone really to find a good scalable solution. So in this case, for the Global Water Challenge, part of the reason that Brian was able to succeed was that he had spent a lot of effort in bringing this together and systematizing this. I think without similar efforts at an organization level, at not an industry level, but sort of a similar linked type of NGO level, for example, if within um, certain countries, certain regions, certain programs, there's a similar type of view that says this is the type of data we should capture and this is the way to use it, I think it's going to be tough. But if you do have that level of this is the type of data, for this type of problem. I do think that with minimal training and automated machine learning, you can then actually take this and deliver on that, but it's gonna require that up front. So if you took that project and said, okay, uh, Brian's gonna be working in West Africa. Mm -hmm. We're working a lot in, in East Africa. Yep. Okay. You've got that template, the data you wanna gather. What about the, the template? We'll start pumping data in there too. Yeah. So for that, the question is, if you have that template, this is what happens here. So if you do have this data, and that would need to be collected or systematized in some way, that template then lets you just say, 
take country one, take country two, take country three, and it has the same output. But if you're in an organization or a series of NGOs that don't have that template for the data, you would face an uphill battle. So given that, I think you actually can, and we found that you can scale this, and that's why we're trying to prove that you can do this not just with, say, uh, systematic water challenges, but other types of problems that don't have that same level of um, data quality, data pervasiveness within the medical industry, within donor programs, within things like this. But if it can then work, you can prove out the value that you get from doing that and then deliver and say, if you can pull this together in this way, you can then take advantage of this in the same way. That's, I think, the longer term vision. But to start with, we want to prove this out one organization at a time as sort of a seed and then crystallize additional sort of scalable solutions for other organizations on top of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, and in this case with the Global Water Challenge, we started with Sierra Leone and we've taken this out to other countries at this point, or the Global Water Challenge has. Please. Yeah, so the question was, suppose that you've got that data and you plug that data in, how do you test out a neural net versus other options versus third options and fourths and so on to say what's working and what the output is and how that's working? So the point of automated machine learning, frankly, is to test out everything, see how it works, and remove the need to tune every model for every single aspect, set up partitioning, look at the results, generate the insights around it, and do all of that time and time again. Data scientists can do this, they do this, and they set up systems to do this, but if you're not at Google, if you're not at Amazon, if you're not at Microsoft, you'll have to recreate that at every organization you go to. So the point of AutoML is not to replace data scientists, but take the same sort of view that you would have for example, back in the late 90s or early 2000s, if you wanted to build a website, you'd have to hire a pretty good software engineer. Today, you can use something like WordPress or other systems to have a template that works. And if you want to go deep, if you need something like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, you would hire engineers to build a fully custom solution that goes as deep as possible. Machine learning is starting to move in that direction. It's still relatively in a nascent phase, but it's going to be equivalent to where you'll still have super advanced teams of academics, data scientists, and engineers building, say, self-driving cars. But for the marketing department, you'll be able to have them solve, say, a propensity model, or in this case, to figure out which parts are going to fail. As long as you have someone who has that template or that system, they can then build that and take advantage of the results. It's, again, not going to be a perfect solution because you can end up in a situation, and I've seen this in practice, where you have marketing teams predict out who's going to leave tomorrow. That doesn't help the retention teams who need to use that model and use that data. The model itself may be perfect, but you can't do anything with it. So you'll still need both the transparency around what's happening with the model, the insights around it, and a lot of the ethical constraints, governance, and guidelines around what's happening. There's no software that's ever gonna replace that. And if you do have data science teams, you can use this to further accelerate what they're doing and iterate much more quickly. But the reality is AutoML is shifting a lot of the focus from data science from building out models, tuning them, testing out a neural network versus a linear model versus an XGBoost versus LightGBM, and instead saying, if you have this problem, what do the results look like? How are the models getting there in terms of their effects or impacts or variables? And what does that then mean when you're making predictions? So automated machine learning is how you can actually solve that in practice. Yeah, go ahead, and then I'll get to you. The question was, is the technology at a spot where you don't need to understand the data to get an effective output? The answer there is yes, with caveats, because you will get an output, but it may not be what you're expecting. And the clearest example I can give of this is that some of the image recognition that's out there was able to identify, and I'm sure everyone's seen this, cat or dog, or is this a dog at all? 
one of the models was actually predicting, is this a dog or a wolf? And it turned out that model was working spectacularly until they started testing it on new areas and new types of wolves. And it turns out what the model was doing was not saying, is this characteristic dog or is this characteristic wolf? It was saying, is there a white background with snow? Because everything that model learned from was wolves out in Canada or some other area. There are additional techniques that have started being developed for image recognition models now that are essentially activation layers that say, what is this model learning from? And it highlights it's these pixels or those pixels and so on. But you still need someone to look at that and say, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever or does make sense. So yes, you can do that, but with caveats that you still want someone to review that and get a sense for how that's working. Yeah. They do. Or it's working, and suddenly the things, the pipes or the pumps that are predicted to fail are not failing because someone's going out and fixing or replacing them. Um, Yeah, so the question was, is there an ability to adapt the model or as things change underneath? Will the model itself still be working or will it start to drift, decay, and fall apart? If you don't update anything, you'll see that exact behavior. And you end up seeing in practice that a lot of times models are put into production after a lot of labor and sweat and tears and carpal tunnel syndrome. And then they're left there and then they start to work fantastic and then a month later they're a little less good and they start to fall off because to your point, there are different circumstances that may be going on. A lot of what was mentioned up here in terms of not just um, building these models or operationalizing them, but getting to a spot where, if I'm back all the way here, we are monitoring these models. That's something that often is missed, frankly. And there are two ways to look at it. One is that you retrain models automatically and adapt them to the new data as it comes in. And the second is that you proactively say that the underlying factors have changed or that something has gone wrong with this model and you should look at this. Both have their merits. Both are certainly doable. I think a combination of those makes sense. In some cases, you just wanna retrain and adapt models automatically. In other cases though, if this model is critically important and the way that it's working matters equally much as the accuracy of it, you instead want to flag, the, for example, the drift of the variables, that something has shifted in terms of new information coming in, new levels, new numbers, new distributions, and you want someone to look at that and say, something has changed with the underlying data from when I built this model. And in that case, they then make an informed decision and say, we need to retrain this model and rebuild it. You're monitoring the results, has the accuracy degraded, but you're also monitoring, have the inputs themselves changed? And without an inability to really monitor that, or retrain these models and adapt them automatically, it can be tough to trust that they're still working as you'd expect. So the quick answer is a lot of models are not monitored or tracked in that way, and you can end up in relatively bad situations or very bad situations very quickly. But there are techniques both to track the inputs, have things shifted, retrain these automatically, or help people make decisions about whether they need to retrain them. It's a good question. So what has DataRobot done internally from an organizational structure or just other approaches like that to stay focused on what is fundamentally not profitable? So I come from economics and I believe that incentives matter. What we do internally is treat any of these organizations as a customer and make sure that every piece of our organization is set up to support that. Part of that's hiring people dedicated purely to these programs so that they don't end up with difficult decisions to say, well, I could work with this organization, but this telecom or this bank or this insurance company or this retailer also has a problem today and they've got a thousand more people that are gonna yell at me versus one person over here that's gonna be sad but may not yell at me. So part of that is making sure that there are some dedicated people, but a bigger piece of it from my perspective is the incentives from our side in working here are that there's nice PR, there's nice sort of, everyone feels good about it, 
But realistically, if we can make organizations like this successful, if we can find ways to scale up not just a single NGO, but then related NGOs, that then translates out to every other organization in the world that have infinitely more resources. So my perspective here is that from an organizational perspective, we treat these groups as customers, we have teams of people that are dedicated to this, but it also means that if we can make this succeed here, we can take this and learn from this and use this as a way to improve our processes. And we can do that in a way that oftentimes we have more creativity and more frankly enthusiasm from these groups that are willing to experiment and don't have existing solutions in place in a way that we can't do that necessarily with an enormous bank that has six to 12 month model risk management reviews and regulators who are breathing down their necks. So the combination of both internal just org structures along with the fact that our incentives are aligned with these organizations to find success, to find sustainable success, and not need to overinvest from our side with every organization. We need to be able to scale up across more and more and more without saying we have to hire linearly more and more and more people. It helps us figure out a way to do that and to really maintain that. So that's both the sort of direct answer. We have organizational structure set up, but it's also our incentives are set up to sign scalable ways to do this. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I am happy to talk about more of these in any detail and happy to go deeper into some of these aspects. I think what I find most interesting across the board is more on the interpretability and fairness side because it's entirely new. Um, unless there's anything else that people wanted to go deeper into, that's what I had planned on focusing on and speaking more about. Are there any other aspects that people wanted to go deeper into from this um, outside of more of the interpretability, the fairness, the bias aspects? All right, and I realize it's hard to say anything in an audience like that, but yeah, go ahead. By one or two models being successful, do you have an example? Or, or what do you mean by that? Sure. So the question was, in terms of the algorithms themselves or the approaches, what are the ones most likely to succeed and what would I bet on if I had to only build one or two? I think this is true within Kaggle as well, which is a data science competition platform. But if you had to choose one model, I would always choose XGBoost or LightGBM, which are roughly comparable, to start with. The challenge of those models is that they overfit and learn too much from the data that you've started with and have a tendency to go too deep into what they're doing. But as long as you stop them from doing that, and there are mechanisms to do so, you end up with models that are able to learn a lot of different interactions and effects very quickly and deliver very good models in a very short amount of time that often have low latency and have natural insights that fall out from those models. So they have a ton of advantages. They are relatively easy to implement. There are open source packages that are everywhere out there, and there's tons of examples on how to implement them. But if I had to choose one model, it would be that. And unlike many data scientists, I would not say a neural network for two reasons. One is that I see them work best in very limited scenarios most of the time. Think something like the Higgs boson problem where you have um, some physical relationship or mathematical relationship. They can be extremely good at picking up on that type of factor. Or in cases where you have incredibly high cardinality categorical variables, think something like image data, think something like you don't just have state and county and zip code, but you have micro-targeting across different segments. They are extraordinarily good at finding good ways to embed those categoricals and extract out information. But if you don't have a lot of data, and if you don't have someone who can tune those again and again to a large degree, you end up suffering from the fact that those models are very sensitive and often don't predict that well out of the box. And if you retrain them, you then have to go through that process again. So from my perspective, if I had to choose one model, I would choose XGBoost. If I chose two, I would choose a linear model and XGBoost because a lot of people who have been doing modeling in some way, shape, or form are familiar with coefficients. Think um, a scorecard like FICO. It's basically a linear model. 
it says that if you have, um, say, an income of X, you have this amount of positive credit score or this amount of negative credit score. If you have a um, demographics, which you can't use for that, um, let's see, if you have this amount of payment history or this number of credit cards or this amount of overdrafts and so on, they basically plug that into a scorecard that translates into a credit score. And when you ask for your credit score, they tell you that your credit score is up higher or lower because of those reasons. Linear models have advantages on that front, but if you don't do a lot of pre-processing and data prep to actually figure out what interactions matter, what variables do you actually want to consider, the linear models end up being less accurate. So you often end up in situations where what ends up working best are combinations of models or taking some of the interpretability of linear models that people are familiar with and translating them over to nonlinear models. That, I think, goes back to the idea of fairness and bias, though, because a lot of models historically have been complete black boxes. Data scientists were, I think, it's fair to say they were at war with statisticians, because statisticians would say that you need to know everything about your data, the distribution of variables, how your model's working, what you're doing, what assumptions you're putting in, and you need to know all of that to then make predictions. And then you would look at how good the predictions are. Data scientists would say, take the data, dump it in, see what the predictions are, if they're not good enough, do that again and again until you get better predictions. Who cares how the model works? That kind of worked if you're competing in Kaggle or if you're a hedge fund just trying to find relationships in market data and so on. But if you then had to tell a sales team why they should go after this prospect or had to tell someone why you're rejecting them for a loan or telling a regulator why you're doing X, Y, or Z, it fell short. So frankly, a lot of the work over the last four, five, six years has been bridging that gap where you don't need to know every single assumption or every single aspect of your data, but you also are not dealing purely with black box models. And a lot of that's had to do with model agnostic approaches. Um, think what variables fundamentally are important for a model. If you have 10,000 variables or 1,000 or 100, which of them are really influencing the model most heavily? That's been a hard question to answer. There's some models that can do that naturally, like XGBoost or linear models, but if you had an SVM or a neural network, you didn't have that output. A lot of those techniques now are focused around finding ways to say not just what the results are, but what's driving those results and what's leading to them. What are the effects of each variable in isolation or in combination? And when you make predictions, what's actually leading to a prediction being higher or lower versus some baseline or some average? All of those now, whether it's SHAP values or um, exemplar approaches, partial dependency plots, uh, permutation-based feature impact, Almost all of the focus is on model agnostic solutions because you can apply those to any algorithm and you can now remove the need to say that this algorithm is working in this exact way that just doesn't work for something like a neural network or an SVM or a similar type of model. What that allows you to then do at a high level, if you have a thousand variables and you look at what's important and you see that income or race or county or other just matters of discrimination, frankly, are leading to you saying that this loan should be applied or not, you can easily cut those out and say, we can't use this. That's already been done for years. There is a Fair Lending Act that says you can't use variables X, Y, and Z, but it also says you shouldn't use variables that are proxies for that. And what you then need to do is not just cut out those raw variables, but find things that are somehow combining to lead to the outcome that you're expecting and look at that in some level of detail. That's why even if you have a model that could just find out the different trends and patterns and make predictions, you still need people to look into how those models are working, what is leading to those results, and how in practice you're getting from the data to the prediction itself. So all of this gives you a baseline and gives you a way to understand more about how the models are working, but you still need people who can put in place this governance structure. And the fundamental issue there is that you always face trade-offs in terms of what can be done. And if you think about that in, um, if you think about this in terms of when I make a prediction for population A or population B, let's take left side of the room and right side of the room, we have more people on the left side of the room. And if we just look at the raw number of people who are predicted to be sitting in a chair or not, you'd end up with a model that says you'll have a higher rate. That's just the reality of what that model's gonna say because there are more people on the left at least from my perspective. But if you instead were saying, what is the percentage likelihood, given a baseline, that someone will be sitting in a chair here, 
you end up in a spot where you'll get roughly comparable results. The problem is both of those two outcomes, you can make models to predict them, but one of those, if you apply them, is going to lead to Proli algorithms predicting higher rates of recidivism uh, for black, patient, or black um, prisoners, and one will say that you have lower rates for white prisoners. If you compare that in different ways based on overall population, if you look at it as percentage population, you can have very different results that lead to essentially institutionalized racism or similar types of impacts from that. And if you don't set up the project to begin with to predict out what you most care about, you'll end up in a situation that leads you astray. The model itself, if you think back to some of those disasters from some of the top companies in the world, are going to learn from the data that you're feeding it. And if you're essentially saying, I want to learn from my process today and make predictions, the predictions will be tied directly to whatever process you have. And in the case of, for example, Amazon screening interviews, the process they had said that if you were a woman, you were going to be less likely to be hired. And what they looked at, they looked at the data coming in and they said, okay, we're going to remove the fact that you are a man or a woman. We'll remove that from all of our screening. They did this and they found out that they were still screening out more women. When they then eventually started to look at the top reasons for why people were being screened out or not, it turned out that organizations like women's softball or other things that were correlated with being a woman versus a man, you were playing baseball instead of softball, were now being used as proxies for who's going to be given an interview or not. And if you don't look at that level of detail, if you just take a blind view and say, we're going to cut out demographics or income or race or gender or so on, you end up with these models that are very powerful, finding other effects or interactions that will be proxies for them. So that's why you can build the models to predict something directly, but you need somebody who can look at the top drivers for why this model is working in the way that it is at a high level. Gender is no longer showing up, everything's good. But when you then look at the top predictions for why someone's not going to be given an interview, or is going to be given an interview and you find out that it's reflecting still gendered terms or gendered aspects in resumes, you need to go deeper and say, we take a step back. We need to either restructure our problem, restructure the data coming in, or rethink what we're doing here. And a lot of those aspects just haven't been available until the last few years because they're relatively new. And again, data scientists have focused just on can we make a good model to predict should we interview someone or not, as opposed to what's leading to us saying that someone should be interviewed or not. So in terms of what this means for the future, I think that everyone is still grappling with how to really tackle this and how to do so in a sustainable way and what types of structures should be put in place from a government perspective, from more of suppose that you've got general rules for this type of model, whether it's lending, whether it's um, hiring, whether it's other things like this, what you can do with these models, what you should take into account, it's frankly not been determined yet and I think it'll be interesting to see where people end up but a big piece of it today is that you need to arm people with the tools and the insights to make those decisions and at least make sure that they're considering them upfront. Because if you don't take them into account, if you don't think about what this may mean or what this may translate to, you end up with a model that may look fantastic in terms of its predictions. You start using it and then you start realizing it has ripple effects that you didn't really incorporate. So moving away from having models act as black boxes, Moving away from the need to have data scientists coding up every aspect of every model every time allows the people with the most domain knowledge to apply that domain knowledge, figure out how the models are working and what their effects are, and do so in a scalable manner. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything out there in terms of every problem that you see in the world, but it is something that we've seen work within for-profit organizations. Some still fail. It is something that we've started to see work with NGOs, and we want to see that we can scale this out in a way that's not going to take a single NGO, but scale out to similar countries doing similar things, and then scale out to other types of completely different challenges that people face. Um, but we do believe that automation is necessary. If you don't have it, it requires additional data scientists every time, and requires those data scientists staying on that project. So thank you all for coming. We're right before six now. Uh, again, I think there's the drinks and everything else in the exhibition call, and thank you for coming today.